You got to your Bible. Maybe you should turn there. Just wanted to point out uh, the basis of my thoughts for Romans 7 before we look at Romans 8. So in Romans 7 and in the sixth verse, it says that we've been delivered from the law, that we should serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. From that verse, clearly, there are two ways that believers seek victorious Christian living. Some, and the right way, through the newness of the Spirit. Others, the wrong way, through the oldness of the letter, of course, of the law. And what that means, the oldness of the letter means believers, I think, more often than not, wrongly seek to live by self-effort. And that always fails, and that always leads to a defeated Christian life that uh, is the basis for that provocative cry in verse 24 of chapter 7. Oh, wretched man that I am! Who shall deliver me from the body of death, this body of death? Well, the answer, the answer to that, that, uh, that cry, oh, wretched man, is in verse 25. See it? Last verse of chapter 7. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. There it is. That's the right way to live a victorious Christian life. It's through the newness of the Spirit. He says, "Through uh, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Self-effort leads to defeat. But if you take the provision of Christ Jesus our Lord, if you take the provision of Christ in you, and thank God, like Paul does there in that 25th verse, and begin to depend upon the Spirit of Christ, that is Christ in you, you'll have deliverance from sin in your life. So self-reliance, that'll lead you into defeat. Spirit dependence, that'll bring you deliverance. So you make your choice. Which is it going to be? Romans 7 living, self-effort, self-reliance, or Romans 8 living, spirit dependence <clears throat> and deliverance? Defeat or deliverance is really the choice that we have when it comes to living a victorious Christian life. I want to pray and then uh, want to jump into chapter 8 of Romans and uh, see a couple of things that I think will, will enable us to understand what Paul means when he says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Heavenly Father, I want to just pause now and once again, just as we sung, Spirit of God, descend upon my heart. Help me to feel thy presence always near. Because it is. Christ in you. Now, Lord Jesus May Christ flow out of that you that Christ is in. And we do pray that you'd give us understanding hearts concerning this important, important part. This is really what the Christian life is all about here. So, Lord, we need to understand this. Enable clarity and enable unclouded thinking, and I pray that you would just use this to give us at least a desire, at least a wedding of our spiritual appetite to live a spirit-filled life, life in the spirit, to experience that. Grant that, Lord. We want to honor you. We want to, we want to live to reflect well upon you. This is what it takes. We can't do it ourselves. And so we thank you for this passage and pray it all for Jesus' sake. Amen.
there's really two things. I want to just look at the first 17 verses as quickly as possible. Two things in these verses. The first eight verses, how do you live a victorious Christian life? The first eight verses is simply this, hope in the Holy Spirit. There is hope in the Holy Spirit. And by that, I mean you depend upon the Holy Spirit. You exercise faith, dependence in him. Look at the first verse. Isn't this wonderful? There is therefore now no, not some, not a little, there is absolutely no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. You know what condemnation is, right? Condemnation is judgment. And this is not talking about there is no condemnation because we're justified. This is in the context, chapter 6, 7, and 8 are in the context of not the believer's justification, but rather the believer's sanctification. And so in the area of sanctification, there is no justific there is no condemnation before God. You see, he is dealing with legalistic views of living the Christian life in chapter seven, right? Well, a legalistic view of living the Christian life views God as just waiting for you to step out of line so he can clobber you over the head, right, with a with a, a heavenly baseball bat, you might say. Romans chapter 7 is about self-effort and how it leads to defeat when you try to live the Christian life by your own self. And when you do that, you not only feel that God's condemning you, because you can't do it perfectly, but you also condemn yourself. And you are repeatedly beating yourself up all the time. You know what? I stopped doing that a long time ago. I used to beat myself up because I wasn't perfect, because I couldn't do it. And I used to think that God was just like he was a bad guy waiting for me to mess up. But there is no condemnation. Talking about believers who are seeking to live a victorious Christian life. There's no condemnation before God or even before yourself. Let's read on. He says in the sec second verse, here's why. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Here is how you can step out in faith, in dependence upon God, and have victory over sin. Do you have a specific sin that you, you find yourself always stumbling in the same thing over and over again? You always fall in that area? I mean, you might fall in other areas, but this is the one that you, you can't ever seem to get victory over. Well, he's telling us there's victory. But it's not by self-effort. It's not my not simply by making up your mind and saying, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm not going to live that way anymore. That leads to defeat. That's self-reliance. We're talking here about spirit dependence. This is the key to victorious Christian living. He says, the law of the spirit of life. He's the law, he, he is the spirit of life, and his law, his law sets you free, gives you liberty and freedom from the law of sin. There's two laws here. There's the law of sin, and there's the law of the Spirit. The law of sin puts you in bondage. The law of sin is sin that indwells us, even though we're believers, we have indwelling sin. The good news is we are not any longer joined to it. Before we were saved, we were joined to indwelling sin. That relationship has ended at salvation. We have been severed and no longer joined to indwelling sin. And so as a result, we can be connected to 
the life of the Spirit of God instead of this indwelling sin that is in us. And here's how it happens. Look at verses 3 and 4. For what the law could not do. Remember, the law represents self-effort, relying upon yourself to live the Christian life. And that doesn't work. The law couldn't do it. Why? Because verse 3 says, it was weak through the flesh because you as a human being with indwelling sin still in your flesh, it makes it impossible for you to fulfill the law of God. It's not that the law is messed up. It's that we're messed up because we still have indwelling, even though we're not connected to it, it's still in us, okay? So it's weak. The law is weak through the flesh. So what did God do to arrange for us as believers to actually live a victorious Christian life and to have deliverance from sin? Here's what he did. He sent his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh in a human body, in flesh like us, only sinless, and through his human body, Jesus condemned sin in the flesh. He died to sin. We were crucified with him. We died to sin with him. That the righteousness, verse 4, of the law might be fulfilled in us through Christ, who walked not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Here's the hope that we have. Not only no condemnation, but what we have described for us in verses 2 to 4 is what I call counteraction. That is, it's not that the law of sin, of indwelling sin magically vanishes from our flesh, from our lives when we get saved, but what happens, we are told here, is that a greater law of counteraction kicks in. A greater law overcomes the lesser law. The greater law of the spirit of life overcomes and counteracts the lesser law of the law of sin. You with me? Follow me thus far? Listen closely. I think, no, seriously, is she the only one that doesn't follow me? You follow me? You got it. Okay. Okay. What I'm saying is what he's talking about in verses two to four is that there is a counteraction going on, a counter offense, if you want to use that word. There is the law of sin at work in our flesh, in our bodies. That law of sin is counteracted by a counter offense that is launched by the spirit of the, the, the spirit of life in us. And thankfully, the spirit of life is infinitely more powerful than the law of indwelling sin in us. Is that clearer? So there's a counteraction where the greater law of the spirit counteracts and overcomes, if you will, the lesser law of indwelling sin. Let me illustrate it this way. I have to wear these glasses now every time I preach because I'm a bit farsighted, which means I don't need these glasses to drive. I can see the mountains, you know, 10, 10 miles away. But it's these small letters on the page of the Bible that I can't see without the, I, I can see them, but I can't make them out clearly because they're too small. Now, if they were larger, I probably wouldn't need the glasses. But right now, it kind of looks a, a, a bit fuzzy. I can tell, you know, uh, if I squint my eyes, I think I could read. But when I put these glasses on, these glasses counteract my farsightedness. So I'm able to read uh, the scripture clearly. And that's what the life, the law of the, of the spirit of life does. When we depend upon the spirit of life in us, he counteracts 
he counteracts the law of indwelling sin in us and corrects it so that we have victory and deliverance from it. Or to illustrate another way, if I'm in uh, uh, swimming in the ocean, let's say I, I fall overboard out on a fishing trip. I fall overboard in deep sea fishing or I'm on a, a merchant vessel like you were and I fall overboard and I, I'm not a good swimmer. I'm not a strong swimmer. And so I'm trying to tread water, but I'm, I'm losing strength and, I, and I'm, I'm sinking. And if I don't get help, I'm going to drown. But someone on board the boat or in the ship throws a lifeline with a, a life preserver hooked to it and says, here, grab this. And I grab on that and I'm able to stay afloat. I'm able to be buoyant, whereas without it, I'm sinking to the bottom. The law of the spirit, the spirit of life, gives me the ability to rise above the law of sin. It counteracts. Does it mean that the law of, uh, of gravity is, uh, is no longer in play? It's that now I have, what should I call it, that, that, life, uh, that, that lifesaver it may be the law of buoyancy. The law of buoyancy overcomes the law of gravity that would pull me to the bottom. So a greater law overcomes, counteracts and overcomes a lesser law. Is that clear? Okay. Okay, good. So sin, indwelling sin, that's what is in you, even though you're a believer. That's what you have indwelling sin. Flesh, the flesh here, that's where the sin operates. That's the turf that indwelling sin works from, your flesh. And your flesh here uh, is, it's not only your inner man, your soul, but it's your body too. That's the, that's the turf in which the indwelling sin works. So sin and the flesh. But what we are told here in verse 3 is that Jesus, by taking on a human body like ours, on that cross, you know what he did? Jesus in a human body, and yet God came into union with human sin on that cross. And through his death to sin, he condemned sin in our flesh so that we could be joined to him and his glorious body. Remember, I said that when Christ died to sin, when you trust him, you died with him. So when you trust him as your savior, that indwelling sin, you're no longer joined to. He was joined to it. And then he died to it and he rose again. And so when he rose again, now you and I are joined to the resurrected Christ instead of indwelling sin. And that's the greater law of the spirit. We're joined to the resurrected Christ. Resurrection power, a life of power that the law of sin is no comparison at all to. So that's counteraction that is being talked about in verses three and four. Condemnation, counteraction, and then verses five to eight, it tells us that we're going to live a victorious life over sin. Not only must we depend upon this, this counteraction, but we must we must be careful about our concentration. Look at it. They that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. They that are after the spirit, well, they mind the things of the spirit. To be fleshly minded, carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So then, 
because the carnal mind is in hostility against God, the fleshly thinking is hostility against God, it's not subject to the law of God. In fact, it's impossible, neither indeed can be. So then, verse 8, they that are in the flesh, those that are fleshly minded, can ever please God, can ever please God. So not only must we understand condemn, no condemnation, the law of counteraction, but we also have to understand the importance of our concentration. That depending upon the Holy Spirit, when it comes to victory over sin in our life, we need to deliberately set the, the focus of our heart to walk in the Spirit and not to walk in fleshly mindedness. We need the control to the control of our focus not to be on a list of do's and don'ts. That's futility. That's what he he, he talks about in verse six. That's futility, and that's deadly. Uh, the futility and the and the mortality or the deadliness of fleshly mindedness. So. Be careful about what you're focused on. Don't be focused on what you have to do in order to live a Christian life, but rather be focused on walking in the Spirit. That's the concentration. If you're focused on the do's and don'ts, that self-effort, and uh, yourself is always, always against God. And so that will deaden spiritual Christian living and make it a total waste. That's what he says in the seventh verse. It's, it's impossible to please God through that in verse 8. Because flesh dependence or self-effort never pleases God. Self is condemned. Our self-life is supposed to die. Our self-life is supposed to be denied so that Christ's life can rise and, to, and uh, can fill us, that we depend upon him and not ourselves. So it's necessary, our concentration has to be right, it's necessary that the Holy Spirit be able, uh, that our focus be on, the, on walking in the Holy Spirit to be able to experience his power to be infused in us and through us. We have to have the right concentration. Can't be on ourself and what we have to do and what we can do, but rather on walking in the spirit, dependence upon him and not ourselves. So that's the first eight verses. Victorious Christian living is hope in the Holy Spirit. Verses 9 to 17, which we want to conclude with, I simply say is hold on the Spirit. Hold on to the Spirit. That's what verses 9 to 17 is about. He says in verse 9, we're not in the flesh, we're in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Walk in the Spirit, by faith. Hold on to the Spirit. Like a little child holds on to his father's hand as he crosses a busy intersection on a street. It is absolutely impossible to live a Christian life, to navigate the Christian life, without a total trust in, dependence upon, reliance on the Holy Spirit. That's what verses 9 to 11 are all about. And there is in those verses a three-step progress of walking in the Spirit. And I don't want this to be laborious, and I don't want this to be confusing, and I don't want this to be overwhelming to you. And if you don't understand it, maybe you can listen to it again online. I don't know. But here's Here's the, the three-step progress of walking in the Spirit. In verse 9, 
what he's saying there is you need to exercise faith. You must depend upon the Holy Spirit to lead you and empower you. Notice he says in that ninth verse, now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's not of his. See the word have? The word have literally means to take. To take the Holy Spirit means to rely upon him. It means to depend upon him. And if you, as he's speaking to believers here, he's saying, if you as a believer are not taking, are not having the Spirit's power, then you're not being his surrendered follower because you're not yielding to the Spirit's lordship. This is not about not being saved or not. This is about being a surrendered follower of Christ or not. You can't live a victorious Christian life without exercising faith, absolute dependence upon him, having him, taking him each moment in order to live the Christian life. So exercising faith, verse 9, the second uh, step in the progression of walking in the Spirit is when you exercise faith, you know what happens? You access grace. And you know what grace is? Yeah, it's undeserved. It's the undeserved supernatural enablement of God in your life. And that's the key to overcoming sin. That's the key to victorious Christian living, that you exercise dependence or reliance upon the Holy Spirit. And when you do that, you access his grace. You access his strength to be victorious. When in surrender you take the Spirit's power, you access that undeserved supernatural enablement to obey God that you can't do by yourself. And the third step is when you exercise faith and you access that strength, that grace, you know what's going to happen? You're going to experience Christ's life in you. That's what verse 11 is. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken or give life to your mortal bodies by his spirit that is presently dwelling in you. Don't misunderstand verse 11. It's not talking about a physical resurrection sometime in the future, although that's true. What he's talking about in verse 11 is simply this, that if you will exercise faith and depend upon the Holy Spirit, you will access his grace, his strength in your life, and you will experience his life right here and now. You will experience the promised life of Christ in you, and that's reviving. That's quickening. You know, we have to believe what the Bible says, and it's very simple. He says Christ is in you if you're a believer. And so when I read that, I say, Christ, you're in me. Let your life flow through me. That's what we're talking. You experience his resurrection life in the spiritual sense in your mortal bodies here and now. Not merely a resurrection body that's glorified in the future. That's talking about here and now. Resurrection power of Christ's life in you, through you. Well, what kind of response? When you understand this truth, if you want to hold on to the Holy Spirit, this kind of reliance, look at what it does. What kind of response should that put in the believer? Verse 12. Therefore, on the basis of this truth that I've just shared with you, brethren, we're debtors. We have an obligation. We are debtors not to the flesh, but to live after the Spirit. Exercise your response to dependence upon the Christ in you. 
upon dependence upon the Holy Spirit. What's your obligation according to verse 12? You have a debt. You have an obligation. You have a debt to depend upon the Holy Spirit so that he can manifest Christ's life in you. You're obligated. That's you. You're a debtor to that. We have an obligation to manifest Christ in you on a regular daily basis. It's an obligation. And when you depend upon the Holy Spirit about that obligation, you know what he does? There's an animation that takes place in your life. Look at verse 13. If we live after the flesh, we'll die. You want to kill Christian living? You want to kill biblical Christian living? Then just try to do it on your own. <laughs> just use self-effort. Just rely upon yourself to live it. And you, I guarantee it, every time you'll, you'll end up in defeat. And spirit, spiritually, you'll, you'll kill Christian living. You'll kill a spiritual life if you rely on yourself. However, the opposite is true. If you depend upon the Spirit, you're not going to kill Christian living. You're going to kill that indwelling sin so you won't carry it out. You're, you'll mortify the deeds or the habits that indwelling sin wants to continue to perpetrate in your life. You want to continue perpetrating that sin that is in your flesh? Then just try to do it yourself. Try to live the Christian life yourself. But if you, you're sick of that, you want deliverance from that, then instead depend upon the Holy Spirit to put to death the things that indwelling sin wants you to do. He'll give you new habits. Those are old sinful. He'll give you new uh, holy habits, you might say. He'll animate you. You, de you depend upon the Holy Spirit, verse 13 says, and you know what's happening? You'll experience a vibrant Christian life. You'll experience the vibrancy of Christ in you, his life. And then look at the provision here. I must have really, really confused some of you, right? <laughs> Wore you out? No. Okay, good, good. Just one then, just one. Verses 14 to 17, I'm done here, okay? This is, this is the last point. Your response, when you depend upon the Holy Spirit, there's an obligation there, you're a debtor, and that will bring you animation. You'll experience the vibrant life of Christ in you. And you will also enjoy the provision. Look at the provision in verses 14 to 17. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they're the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage, again, to fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Now, I don't think that many believers really understand this concept of adoption. Many times when I see it, uh, either in reading a Christian book or hearing a message, it often gets confused with being born again, becoming a son or a child of God. That's not what adoption is. Adoption is not the new birth. That's something different. What adoption is, is when you are born again, you are placed by God the Holy Spirit in a position of mature sonship, giving you total access, or access rights, I should say, to the inheritance of the life that is available now in the Spirit. That's what adoption is. Adoption doesn't make you a child of God. Adoption is the, the, the provision that a child of God can enjoy in that you are recognized by God as a full 
mature son in him with total access to your rights of inheritance of all the life that is available in the Holy Spirit that Christ won for us at the cross. And when you understand that provision, you don't live in fear, as he says in verse 15. You don't have the spirit of fear anymore. You don't live in fear, but instead you live in an increasing love for God, and that increasing love for God produces an intimacy between you and God where you can call him Papa, Abba, Daddy. And you'll always live in an acceptable, as accepted by him, I should say, not feeling rejected. That's what verse 16 says. The spirit, when you depend upon him, he's going he's gonna to bear witness with your human spirit that you're accepted of Abba. You're accepted in, uh, of the Father. And you'll, you'll, you won't feel rejected by him because you'll, you're no longer a slave. But rather, verse 17 says, you're a joint heir with Christ. Wow. You're a joint heir with Christ? That's what it says here. You're a joint heir with everything that Christ is and everything that Christ has. All that provision. So you access your spiritual inheritance right now. It's not something you get when you get to heaven. You access it right now because it's for now. It's for living this victorious Christian life. You access this spiritual inheritance now. But guess what? It's not automatic. You only access it by faith, as I said. When you access it by faith, then you experience it. And if you don't access it by faith, you know what you do? You forfeit it. It's so sad that so many believers don't live successful Christian, victorious Christian lives because they forfeit the spiritual inheritance that is theirs. They may not even know about it, but you know about it now. So don't be like Esau who forfeited his birthright. He exchanged his birthright for temporary comfort, food in his belly, for pleasure, temporary pleasure, or a temporary lifestyle. Don't be like Esau and exchange temporary comfort, pleasure, and lifestyle for a spiritual inheritance now and eternal reward to come. Start walking by faith in the Spirit. Simply come to the point where you say, I can't do this. That's a great place to be at. Defeat. Because then you can say, but Lord, according to your, your word, you can do this. You're in me. Your life is in me. And so I'm going to depend not on myself anymore, but I'm going to depend upon you. And you know what? I hate to even uh, use this uh, terminology, but it's true. You will experience, you will feel the very life of Christ flowing through you. You know when it's happening. You know that God is at work through you. You have a sense of that when you learn to depend and rely on the Spirit. When you exercise faith, dependence on Him, you access grace, you access His strength, His ability, because you, you're unable, and then you experience His life, and you feel it. You know it's Him and not you. Have you ever sensed that? Have you felt that? Maybe you're speaking with someone and you're really relying upon the Lord and, and when it's all said and done, maybe you don't realize it then, but when it's all said and done, you think, wow, that wasn't me. That was God. This is his life. This is supposed to be a daily experience for us all. This is how we're supposed to live. This is what it's about. This is why you've been defeated in your Christian life, because you haven't understood and you haven't exercised the faith, and so you haven't accessed the grace, and so you haven't experienced the life. It's really our fault. 
This is our portion. This is the provision. This is what God wants for us. This is what the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus is all about, to justify us and to give us this wonderful provision all the while we're here until we see him. And then the final aspect of salvation, total glorification. 